of Jacobson in Yale and um, perversely wanted to work on commutative algebra instead of what Jacobson was doing. And uh, so Jacobson, I, I guess I had had some contact with Jacobson, mostly through Kaplansky previously when I was a student. Kaplansky liked my work and suggested <clears throat> my name to Jacobson at some point. And so Jacobson had the idea for which I'm forever grateful of sending Craig to Brandeis to play games with me. Uh, I think I didn't know quite what a jewel I had there, but we had a good time together. I remember sitting on the lawn and talking about commutative algebra with Craig. And uh, he, of course, wrote his thesis with D sequences. I was very interested in, in matrix things and and minors of matrices at the time, and still am. And uh, this was the beginning of a long friendship. He's, he too has been kind to me in ways that cost him personally, I think, in later years, um, and kind to mathematics generally, really a very uh, generous nature. I always associate that with being Midwestern, though I think there are unpleasant people in the Midwest, too. But Craig certainly not among them. And uh, one of the sweetest people I know. And one of the best mathematicians. So with that said, let me go on to the subject. I, I think probably everybody here knows what a resolution is. Uh, you have some module over some ring. I'll mostly work over local rings. Uh, Kaylee will come into the discussion, but doesn't need to be there yet. Um, let's see. I think one of these is the right one. Yes. Uh, and uh, so a resolution, you have some local ring R with maximum ideal N, perhaps, residue field K. And the resolution, you have some R module, finitely generated. Everything in sight today will be finitely generated and Ethereum. So M is a finitely generated module. You want to understand it. So you begin to understand it by producing generators of M and relations, or let's call this N0, or N1, some relations. And then you say, well, I still don't understand M very well. Uh, and Hilbert had the idea that you could understand it better by continuing this process and uh, looking at the relations on the relations, Rn2, and so on. And Hilbert proved famously that if you have, if R is a polynomial ring, then the process is finite, uh, pre-resolution can be finite. And in this minimal, in this local case, you could say a minimal free resolution, and then it just is finite. Minimal. So at a certain point, you get to R sub NK, and then the next kernel is zero. So. So that's Hilbert's syzygy theorem. But let me back up a little further. Uh, I want to say so much, not so much what is a free resolution, since you all know that, but rather why is a free resolution. And uh, I think the first person to have a good use for these things is actually predates Hilbert by quite a bit, Arthur Cayley in 1848. was interested in one of the primary algebraic problems of the time, namely the elimination theory. Given a system of polynomial equations, can you tell whether it has a solution or not? And uh, Cayley adapted what was not yet called the Kazool complex to um, answer that question. As you all know, a system of elements is a regular sequence if and only if the Kazool complex is exact 
and you can test that exactness in a finite dimensional way too, just by looking at a certain element of the co-kernel to see whether it's zero or not in the case when you have a homogeneous regular sequence, let's say. So Cayley was interested in the question in projective space, so his polynomials were homogeneous, and of course the system has a non-trivial solution, then if and only if uh, the polynomials don't generate an irre irrelevant ideal. And so if you have n plus 1 variables and n plus 1 polynomials, you can test whether it is a generates the irrelevant ideal by testing whether it's a regular sequence. And the Kuzul complex was invented by Cayley for that purpose. So I don't know whether Hilbert knew about Cayley's work or not, but he uh, gave us, as an example, first examples of free resolutions. He gave the Kuzul complex. Hilbert, of course, was interested for a different reason. He was interested in counting the number of independent invariants of a group action. Finite groups are, are relatively easy in this regard, but the problem of the day, and really the main problem that afflicted the people in that period of the 19th century, around 1890, was to, to compute and count the invariants of certain actions, mostly of SL2, but other groups as well. So if you look at the SL2 acting on polynomials in, or GL2 acting on polynomials in two variables linearly, then there's an induced action on the polynomials of degree D. And if you think of polynomials of degree D in terms of their coefficients, then you're looking at the D symmetric power of the standard representation. And you can look at polynomials on that, which are invariant of the group action. And this had been computed with great effort and difficulty in a number of cases. Basically, they could do D up to about 8 at that time. And um, they always found out that the number of invariants, number of new invariants that you got in degree uh, M, let's say, if you made a, that into a power series, that turned out to be a rational function in M which amounts to saying that there's some linear recurrence relation for the number. And people had observed that in all these cases. And Hilbert sort of wiped up the field by computing nothing, but proving that that was always the case. And the reason was that if you have a finite resolution over a graded ring, then you can compute the what we now call the Hilbert function of M in terms of the... Uh, resolution. So if you have a graded ring, then you can compute the uh, a graded free resolution. And I think this will work. So you want the Hilbert function of M. You know the Hilbert function of the ring itself. That's just some combinatorial thing about the uh, uh, number of monomials of a given degree. And so if you take the alternating sum of the Hilbert functions of the different free modules, you get the Hilbert function of M. That was Hilbert's uh, contribution. In his case, he proved the finiteness, finite generation of the invariants that gave him a finitely generated module to work with, and then uh, in, introduced finite free resolutions in order to compute the Hilbert function. So this was a big deal at the time, and really made Hilbert famous as a mathematician. So this was Hilbert's great, great papers on commutative algebra around 1890. Uh, let me go back to this. Around 1890. Then uh, the next use, big use of finite free resolutions was perhaps the one by Sayre. So let's jump. Uh, almost 100 years, not quite. And Sayre used them for a different purpose. If you have two varieties meeting in a point, then you would like to say that there's a nice, nicely defined intersection multiplicity. And people had assumed that if they met at a point lo 
represented by this local ring uh, are, let, let's now say that R is regular. Need to avoid questions which will come up later. So and I, I'll call my regular ring S, SN regular. <clears throat> let's say the local ring of a point on a smooth variety. <clears throat> then you'd like to say if you have two uh, sub-varieties of that smooth variety meeting at a point there, meeting at that point, point P, let's say, in X, uh, then if you have Y and Z and Y intersect Z as a set, is just P. Then you'd like to assign an intersection multiplicity to Y intersect Z. And people uh, initially th thought by analogy with plane curves that you could just take the ideal of Y and the ideal of Z and add them and look at the length. So it's the fact then that if you take S modulo, the ideal of Y plus the ideal of z. Hmm. I don't know why I got that line. Then the length of that is finite. And so uh, people thought perhaps the length would be equal to the multiplicity of intersection. That's OK for plane curves. where S is the local ring of a point in the plane. But there are troubles in higher dimensions. For example, if you have two planes meeting in a point in pore space. So these are supposed to be planes meeting in a point. And if you cut that with another plane, so in pore space, typically a plane meets another plane in a point. So if you cut it with a general plane, so here's Here's y, let's say, and z is a plane. Then y intersect z, typically for general z, is two different points, one for each plane. But if you have the temerity to pass your, your plane z through that intersection point, so the point is there, P is there. Then the length of uh, S mod the ideal of Y plus the ideal of Z. Everybody can write down those ideals easily and make this computation. That turns out to be three and not two. So this was a problem. It's very desirable in algebraic geometry that intersection multiplicities should be preserved when you move the varieties around. So this this uh, felt wrong. Grebner, uh, who put forward the definition as the length, said that this just showed that that uh, property of of intersections being the same number for every choice of z just was wrong. And there was a controversy between him and other mathematicians, Van der Waarden, and he had a correspondence about this in which Van der Waarden said, well, you know, it's very nice to think about lengths, but we have to give up these things if they don't agree with our, our real desires, which is for continuity, preservation of number, it was called. And Van der Waarden carried the day. And there were definitions that then people played with. I think Samuel had one, and Van der Waarden proposed something also. And uh, there were definitions that made the number come out to be two. But the real key was, I think, then, or the most impressive thing for me, was a theorem by Sayre. And Sayre said, this uh, length, this thing, is really just Tor 1 of uh, S mod I, S mod, 
or sorry, towards zero, S mod I of Y, S mod I of Z. So this is the length of that. But uh, if you subtract Tor 1, you get the right answer. So he uh, proved uh, famously that the right multiplicity of y and z meeting at a point p is the alternating sum of the lengths of the tor i's. And uh, this turns out to have all the good properties. There's still mysteries about when it's zero or positive, but uh, this was a very satisfactory result. However, notice it depends on the resolution being finite. Right, we compute this by resolving S mod I Y, let's say. And um, if the resolution is not finite, then there'll be infinitely many of these tours, and the alternating sum might not make any sense. So uh, this is very much a theorem about finite resolutions. Now, certainly in the 60s, people were interested in the more general case. And the first reason, I think, that, that was around for a serious interest was probably in cohomology of groups. There, the, the homology, let's say, of uh, group G with coefficients in some G module M is by definition the uh, tor over the group algebra K of G of uh, what amounts to the residue field. I guess I'm working over K, so I'll say K here uh, with coefficients in M. So the resolution of K was the important object, the resolution of K over the group algebra. Now it turns out that in a lot of cases, the complexity of, of the representation theory of G and the complexity of G itself doesn't depend on the whole group algebra, which is, of course, very non-commutative, but it depends mostly on the maximal abelian P subgroups. Of course, in, in characteristic zero, this is all rather trivial. Characteristic zero uh, only tor zero. Everything is semi-simple. But in characteristic P, which is where people were interested in, there are infinitely many of these things. And um, the complexity somehow depends on how big a copy of Z mod P to the N is contained in, in G. So, of course, there's a Celo P subgroup. The Celo P subgroup might con is probably not abelian, but certainly contains a copy of Z mod P. But it might contain a direct sum of copies of Z mod P. By the way, the case where it contains just one copy, those are called thin groups. And uh, a huge deal in, in finite group theory is made over the classification of thin groups. And then the next case is quasi-thin groups, where n is 2, and then quasi-quasi-thin groups, where n is 3. And then things get more uniform for larger n. But this is really, the, the in some sense, the main thrust of the classification theory of finite groups is to study these um, uh, elementary abelian subgroups of the group. So this is, as I say, a big deal. In, in that case, P is 2. The interesting case there is 2. When I was a student at 
at the University of Chicago years and years ago. John Thompson was one of the main figures in the faculty, and he was working on groups of odd order. So the idea is that odd order groups, which have none of these Z mod twos in them, are somehow simpler. Not very simple, I have to say, and the big paper of Thompson and Fight settled that there were no extra simple groups, except the obvious ones, uh, in odd order, for odd order. Anyhow, that's a digression, but important in our story because John Tate was interested in group cohomology in the service of um, number theory. And so he was interested in computing these things and interested in particular in computing the tor over this subgroup. So Tate, this is about 1960 now, uh, computed a free resolution of the residue field K over the ring uh, K. This is a characteristic P ring necessarily to be of interest, K of Z mod P to the N. Now this, this ring is rather familiar to commutative algebraists in a different form. Ah, unfortunately, we have a noisemaker on my roof. I hope you can't hear it objectionably. Um, they promised me they wouldn't make noise until eight. We can, we can hear you fine, David. Can you? Okay, yeah. good. Um, so uh, if you uh, look at the group elements that generate uh, this group Z mod P to the N, so G to the P is, is zero or uh, g to the p is 1, I should say. Let's write that in that form. And if I look at g, then mod 1 to the p, it's 0 in the group algebra. So it's generated by, by these things. So this is really the polynomial ring in n elements. Mod each xi to the p. So this is a complete intersection. And Tate uh, recognized this, uh, of course, and, and wrote a paper then about resolutions of the residue field over complete intersections. So uh, resolution of K over any complete intersection ring. I'll abbreviate that as CI for the moment. So those are the first infinite resolutions which are important, I think. And Tate observed that the free modules could be written in a very simple way. You have the Kazool complex of the variables inside. So uh, let's call this F. And then what you have is the Kazool complex first. The Kazool complex, of course, begins uh, K and then the ring S and then we have n variables s to the n and wedge 2 s to the n and so on. Nice and finite. Wedge n s to the n and that's the end of it. However, it's never exact except in a regular ring at this point. And what's wrong is that the generators of the um, ideal I should have put an S mod I here, sorry. The generators of the ideal uh, go to zero and, or are zero, and you can express them in terms of the maximal ideal. This is the uh, row of variables. And so they, you can express the generators in terms of that, and those are zero. So you have another term, which is as many uh, as there are generators of the ideal, s to the m maybe, necessary there. And Tate proved that the uh, whole resolution f was a tensor product 
of the Kazul complex, where to S mod I to the uh, N, this should have been an S mod I2, tensored with the, the dual of the symmetric algebra, sim of S mod I to the M. And then the graded dual of that. So it's a very simple structure. And that got people interested in infinite resolutions, I think. This is about 1960, as I say. And uh, so Kaplansky at that time was thinking about projective dimension, homological algebra. And he posed the problem whether all infinite resolutions might be like this one. So what is like this one? This is, this is almost a, a polynomial ring, right? It's mostly a polynomial ring tensored some little bit finite dimensional piece. And so its Hilbert function is rather simple. This is the Hilbert function of a graded module whose generators are actually all in one degree. So it's really just a polynomial. But uh, again, if you make a power series out of Hilbert functions of things with generators in many degrees, then those are rational functions. So Kaplansky either conjectured or posed the problem. Let's, let's say it's a conjecture. I think that's a it's plausible conjecture that Kaplansky conjectured it because uh, Kaplansky had the philosophy, which he expounded to his students, including me. I always listened to him when he talked, though I wasn't officially his student. He had the philosophy that you should always pose as a conjecture the strongest thing that you think would be possibly true, because that would give people the most interesting thing to shoot at. And if they proved, disproved your conjecture, then they would feel very good. Or if they proved your conjecture, they would feel even better, perhaps. But I would, it would get the competitive juices flowing. I'm sure Craig and Mel would understand that philosophy very well. And, um, and therefore, it would produce the most mathematics. He wasn't interested in being right. He was interested in, in getting people to produce mathematics very sensibly. So let's say he conjectured that um, the Poincaré series of every local ring is a rational function. And here the Poincaré series is defined the following way. You take the, the K, you take its minimal free resolution, uh, S mod I. This is the local ring now. I guess I should start using R for a local ring. Let me back up and say R. Uh, then you get some stuff, F1, F2. This goes on probably forever. And you take summation. Uh, well, he took the positive sum. I'm not quite sure why. Summation of um, T to the I times the rank of F sub I as a free module. I equals zero to infinity. Okay, that's the Poincaré series, P R of K. So that should be a rational function. And then people started proving it was a rational function and they proved it in lots and lots of special cases. Many special cases are known. Now, at this point, I want to change gears a moment and tell you a political story about mathematics. Yes, mathematics has politics in it. Jan Eric Roos was a postdoc at Berkeley when I was a student there. Very attractive, interesting mathematician, very powerful mathematician. He was working on category theory at the time, and he was from Stockholm. 
he was there at, at Chicago, I think just for a year. And after I graduated, a few years later, I was on a long-term visit in France. Uh, and I went to visit Ruth in Stockholm. So we were both very young men at the time. And he and Jan Erik Björk, who was also there, were plotting to change mathematics in Sweden. At that time, mathematics in Sweden was essentially dominated by partial differential equations and partial differential operators. It was a very powerful group there. And there was essentially no algebra. And Roos and Björk were both algebraists and wanted to change that. And so they plotted, and Roos felt that it would be possible to choose a problem in algebra and gather a group of people uh, who would work on that problem. And that would be the way to build up algebra in Sweden. And this strategy worked brilliantly, actually. Uh, and algebra in Sweden has been going strong ever since. The problem he chose was Kaplansky's problem, or Kaplansky's conjecture about Poincaré series of a local ring. And so he built up a school there. Uh, Freuberg is a representative of it. Mats Boy is a descendant of it. Anders Björner came at some point in that time. Um, Roos has died a few years ago, but the school lives on. And they worked on this problem a lot. Lucho Avramov became their collaborator and did a lot of important things in this area. Uh, and the focus was very much on the ranks of these FIs. It was a numerical problem that they were trying to solve in some sense. So a great deal of work was done. And then the balloon was popped in a way. David Anik found a counterexample. Now to understand where that came from, you have to know that there's another place where resolutions of the residue field in, over local ring are as important. And that was in Sullivan's work on rational homotopy theory. There's something called a, a minimal model in homotopy theory. And it turns out that it has something to do with this question and with this resolution. So David Anik was really a topologist by training. And he pointed out, basically, that the topologists had known a counterexample to this conjecture for a long time already in this other context of rational homotopy. And he was able to adapt it uh, to the commutative algebra situation. So he found a counterexample. Quite simple, actually, just beyond the examples that people had been able to do or, or discuss. So, well, did that stop the field? Not at all. Mathematicians uh, are always capable of pivoting to a slightly different problem. And then the problem became, well, when is the Poincaré series rational? Or if not, what is it anyway? How, how fast do the Betty numbers grow? So um, the field still revolved around, uh, and still does revolve around, um, size of the Betty numbers. The Betty numbers are the ranks of these Fi. But there's more to a resolution than that. If you have a resolution, minimal resolutions over a local ring are unique up to isomorphism. So all those matrices up to equivalence of matrices are also part of the invariance that you get. And you can ask much more refined questions about the um, matrices. Now, in the case of finite resolutions, this had been already a big deal. So back to finite resolutions for a moment. David Buxbaum and I and many other people, Mel and Craig among them, uh, other people, no doubt, in this audience, were interested in the structure of finite resolutions. And we proved some Theorems, of course, Hilbert already had had understood the the uh, 
structure of resolutions of length two of a cyclic module. So a resolution of S mod I, oops. When S is a polynomial ring and I is homogeneous and, and projective dimension, I is projective dimension one or S mod I is projective dimension two. And that was generalized by, by Lindsay Birch to the case of local rings, same for local, regular local rings, or any local ring where S mod I has projective dimension two actually. So this, and the structure was really a theorem about the matrices in the resolution and the ideals of minors in the matrices. So the emphasis was ideals of minors of matrices in the resolution. But for some reason, this didn't bleed over into the study of infinite resolutions, and people kept on studying this numerical question. Well, it turns out that there's a lot to say about ideals of minors in a resolution. And uh, recently, I got interested in this also for the case of infinite resolutions in work with Heilong Dao, which I'll tell you a little bit about. First, let me uh, backtrack for a moment and just mention that the case of finite resolutions is by no means closed, and there are plenty of problems there. And a typical one is, well, Birch did the case of length two. How about length three? And Yerja Wayman, who was a student of Buxbaum, uh, put forward a very revolutionary kind of idea in, back in, in 89 that there could be a structure theorem for resolutions of length three, too, but the base of the, of the family of resolutions would not be a finite dimensional base in general, but rather a, an infinite dimensional graded Lie algebra. Horrible, we thought, because who, who among commutative algebraists knows about infinite dimensional Lie algebras? But uh, Wayman wasn't afraid of this. And he pursued this off and on over the years without making decisive progress until quite recently. And now he and a group of his students, um, among them in particular, a very bright student of mine named Shanglong Ni, has really uh, finished this program in a special case. Turns out that sometimes these infinite dimensional Lie algebras are, are only finite dimensional. They're uh, sometimes really infinite dimensional. And the cases when they're finite dimensional correspond, to, as usual, to the Dinkin diagrams, the, the ADE Dinkin diagrams. And that corresponds to looking at free resolutions over a local ring with just certain Betty numbers, certain sequences of Betty numbers. So among the sequences they like, are one n n one, and they're interested mostly in in Cohen Macaulay s mod i's, and many of you know that when you have a Cohen Macaulay ring s mod i, and its Betty numbers are it has n generators and and the syzygies are one of ranks one n n one, then uh, Buxbaum and I proved that it's uh, generated by the Fafians, that's the square roots of the maximal minors of the middle matrix, um, and that's the Gorenstein case. So that's one of the cases that turns out to be one of the Dinkin cases, and it looks as though the other cases will be not as simple, but as manageable in the end as that one. So there aren't so many different sequences of, of Betty numbers that work, Famously, 1683 is not one of them. That's going to be an infinite dimensional family. But um, uh, the Dinkin case looks like it's going to be 
completely settled and a famous conjecture of of uh, Hunicke and Ulrich, I believe, is that in, in what turns out to be those Dinkin cases, the ring S I will always be Leachy, if you know what Leachy means. That's too big a digression to go down that road. But that's one of the things that Shang Long Ni and Yerja and their collaborators have proven now, I think. Not quite um, all written down yet, so take it with a grain of salt. But I'm convinced that this is uh, going to be written down soon and proved. Anyway, that's the progress in the finite case, but what about the infinite case? So Long and I began playing with this question and turned out that there was one case which was particularly simple, and I'm going to describe it to you, and uh, also uh, tell you some of the experiments we've made, which look like they might be good theorems, but we can't prove them except in special cases. So, so what's the easy case? Turns out that Lindsay Birch, the student of David Rees, which is who is famous for among us for the Hilbert Birch theorem, did some other pretty nice things too. And she defined a class of rings which uh, Long has christened Birch rings with his collaborators. So what's a Birch ring? Or in fact, I'll define something more, the Birch index of any ring. So suppose you have a, a local, a regular local ring S again. An ideal in S. Uh, and I'm going to be interested in R, which is S mod I. And the first case will be when R is depth zero, but we'll reduce to that case by factoring out regular sequences. So we say that the uh, Birch index, so if uh, the depth of R is zero, and I'll say that the Birch index of R is the dimension of the maximal ideal mod a certain Birch ideal. I'll write it bi. Uh, that's a bad notation, isn't it? Of i. Um, let's just call it b of i for this talk. b of i. What's b of i? b of i is the following peculiar looking thing. Let's look at the maximal ideal. So I didn't say what the maximal ideal was. So I'll write n for the maximal ideal again, and k for the residue field of s. And b of i is then n times i colon with the socle i colon n. OK? So how should you think about that? I think of it this way. Here's, here's i, so here's s, and it kind of looks like this, right? Here's the unit element. Here are the variables, x1 up to xn. So i is some funny thing down here. Let's think about the Artinian case. And then the socle of i, the socle of s mod i, which is i colon n, mod i that's this this thin layer up here right here's the socle and n times i those are, those are the things that are not generators so n times i is the stuff down here n i right so we're interested in what throws the socle into n times i. And from this picture already, it's clear that the Birch ideal contains the square of the maximal ideal. And since um, i colon n is not contained in i, this is not doesn't contain the unit element, so it's contained in the maximal ideal. So this little sandwich, m mod m squared, is finite dimensional vector space, dimension equal to dimension of the ring. 
and some of the variables are in i colon n mod n i, and maybe all of them, or maybe not. So this this Birch index is, is essentially the number of variables which are not in n i colon i colon n. So just as an example, if you take uh, Yeah, why don't I have a, there we are. So if you take i equal to a power of n, n to the p, let's say, then i colon n is i is n to the p minus 1. And n i, obviously, is n to the p plus 1. So the Birch ideal in this case, is n to the p plus 1 colon n to the p minus 1, and that's n squared. So in that case, I wrote m here for the maximum ideal, because I usually do. But this should have been, of course, uh, n. And so in this case, the Birch ideal is n squared. and the Birch index is whatever the dimension of S is. So Birch index. Yeah. Yeah. Birch index. Is equal to the dimension of S, simply. So that's a, a typical case, a rather trivial case. And the Birch index can be any number it wants up to the dimension of s, including 0. I'll tell you some computations of the Birch index in a minute. But here's a characterization of things of positive Birch index. So a Birch ideal, i, why is this not there? i is Birch. This is a definition. if it has Birch index at least 1. OK. And here's a characterization of Birch. And a Birch ring is a Birch ideal, is S mod a Birch ideal. Uh, I want to define this outside the depth 0 case, too, if depth uh, s mod i is bigger than 0, reduce mod a regular sequence. A general regular sequence, linear regular sequence, and then compute the Birch index. So Birch of uh, S mod i, in general, is equal to the Birch of S mod i plus this regular sequence, by definition. OK, so that gives us a definition in general. You might ask whether it's independent of all the choices I made. And the answer in the zero-dimensional case, or the depth zero case, is yes. I don't know whether it's independent of this regular sequence, um, but in, it probably is. And I'm not so concerned. I'm mostly concerned with the case of depth 0. OK, so suppose uh, that a depth, I'll write r for s mod i always, depth r is 0, then R is Birch, if and only if the residue field is a sum end of the second syzygy of K. So something as funny is happening in this resolution of K. Right, I have K, here's S or R, I guess then r to the n 
Here's the second syzygy, sys 2k, and we continue r to the n, this was r to the n1, maybe r to the n2, but in the minimal resolution has to be, as a sum end in this case, another copy of the minimal resolution of k shifted back to. So at least every second syzygy will have a copy of k in, the, in it, right? So this obviously implies that sys 2n of k contains a, a sum end. I'm writing k divides that to mean that k is a direct sum end of that, not just a submodule. Very strange behavior. And not too hard a theorem is that, in fact, k divides every syzygy starting with the second one. k is a sum n if, 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 we're, if the ring is birch. Birch implies K divides uh, cis M of K for all M at least two. So, so that's kind of surprising phenomenon that had never been observed, as far as I know, in. Uh, in the study of infinite resolutions, right? It's this self-reproducing phenomenon, very peculiar. Well, how common is that after all? What about other modules, for example? So here's a theorem that, that Dow and I proved. This is all work with Dow. Uh, if R is birch and M is any finitely generated module, let's say zero dimensional, or depth zero is really what I mean. I keep getting this funny stylus, depth zero. Then cis m, or let's say cis p of m, contains the sum end k for all p at least seven. Somehow, if you think about things like this, you might expect p at least the dimension, the embedding dimension of r, or some other measure of r. But 7 is a bit of a surprise there. Might be true for all p at least 5, uh, but I can't prove that. We can't prove that. Um, but this shows, this is very peculiar behavior indeed. For example, this is true uh, oh, I'm sorry, Birch of index at least two. This is not true for all Birch rings. Index at least two. Uh, so, but it's true, for example, for the rings of the form S mod of power of the maximal ideal. Even that was, as far as I know, completely un noticed in the past that some somehow syzygies cropped up with k's in them. k has nothing to do with m a, a priori, right? It uh, just appears out of nowhere there. It's really not a sum end of m um, in general. So this is, for me, a very surprising result. It brings up the question of what is this condition, Birch index at least two, I, how many rings have this property? And I wanted, since I do want to prove something in, in a talk, I thought I would um, try to prove something about this. But first, let me just mention that we've seen lots of other uh, 
strange regularities. Sorry about that. Is my screen visible again? Can you see my screen? Yes, you're quite visible, as is your tablet. Okay, good. Um, my, my iPad turned itself off for a moment. So another regularity we've seen is the following. If you look at any, any local ring, R, and any finitely generated module, and you make the minimal resolution of M, uh, let's say F minimal resolution, and phi sub i is the ith matrix in that resolution. Then in analogy with the finite resolution case, you could, you could think that maybe the ideals of minors of these phi's would be interesting. Now, you can't talk about the ranks of the phi's very well because too many things are zero in R. Maybe R is zero-dimensional. Um, so it's not going to be interesting to talk about the ranks of the fees, but you could still talk about an ideal of minors of a given size. So, for example, you could take about you could talk about the ideal of one by one minors of phi i. That's an interesting sequence of ideals, um, and what we have observed in a number of examples, all the examples we've looked at, is that this sequence of ideals stabilizes or becomes periodic of period two. That can happen. Or becomes periodic. It happens quite quickly in most examples we've looked at. We tried to guess how far back you had to go, but we were unable to do that. Well, our conjectures turned out to be false after a while. But nevertheless, if you write down some simple ring where you can really compute this for a number of steps, you'll never compute infinitely many, of course, um, you'll see that this is true. And for Golid rings, you can just about see why it's true. So I think that, that I haven't uh, dotted the I's in the proof, but I think this is going to be true and relatively easy for Golid rings, where you can write down an explicit resolution of modules. But um, in general, I don't know. So that's, uh, that's a completely open question. You can ask about larger order minors, too. That seems to be true, too. But again, I can't prove any such thing. Um, so I'll leave that just open. And instead, let me tell you a computation of, oh, I see I have one minute left, so maybe I won't prove it after all. But it's interesting to know some class of rings where you can actually compute the Birch index. So the, of course, the simplest class is always perfect ideals of codimension two. So theorem, if I in S, S is, local, is regular, remember, perfect of codimension 2. So then I is the ideal of minors of some matrix. I is equal to some I N of a matrix M. Maybe I could call it something else. A of size N by N plus 1. Then R uh, the Birch index of I is essentially the number of linear forms in the matrix A, and dimension of the space of those. So Birch index of I is the minimum of, uh, state this correctly, the minimum of two and the um, the number of variables that appear. So the dimension of this matrix, 
the ideal of 1 by 1 minus of a plus the square of the maximal ideal mod the square of the maximal ideal. Turns out that this is the Birch ideal in that case. So if there are some linear forms, independent linear forms appearing as the leading forms of entries of A, then you get significant Birch index. If there's at least one, it's a Birch ideal. If there are two, then you get this very strong theorem about the resolution of every module over S mod I. And with that, I think I'll stop and thank you for your attention. And Uh, are there any questions? Um, there must be someone. No. Okay, well, um, thank you, David. Uh, and um, uh, I, let us thank you again.